Hello and welcome to IO Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zubko. Today we're going to speak about identity, constructivism, political orders, regimes. But why? The question I would like to ask to my expert today about identity comes from my knowledge about new articles published and uh, new reports that I notice that scholars are using identity, identification more and more. Uh, there are questions about identity of Ukraine, for instance, uh, identity of Russian foreign policy. Now we have a conflict in Gaza, so identity is used more and more. And I think it's time to clarify a few facts coming from the international relations theory. My expert today is Professor Richard Netlebov. Hello. Good day to you. Professor Richard Nedlebo holds the distinguished position as Emeritus Professor of International Political Theory within the World Studies Department at King's College London. Additionally, he is an Honorary Fellow at Pembroke College, University of Cambridge, and a Fellow of the British Academy. Ned's primary interests encompass a wide range of subjects within the field of international relations. Those include, for instance, conflict management, the root of cause of war, psychology of decision-making and learning, as well as ancient and modern political theory. Additionally, Ned's research extends to the intricate domains of politics and ethics of identity. Certainly, I would recommend exploring Professor Lebov's career by visiting his personal website, netlebov.com, where you can also access his 27-page CV. So that's a short introduction of Professor Lebov. Let's start with the first question. In your view, how does identification differ from the traditional concept of identity? And what does it mean for the state behavior? How can we understand state behavior via those concepts? Uh, this, these are two very good questions, both of them related. Let me start by distinguishing identity and identification because they reflect uh, two very different and diametrically opposed understandings of human nature. Secondly, let me talk about the similarities, but mostly the differences between states and people. The concept of identity is uh, a modern one. Uh, it really begins with John Locke who conceptualized the person primarily for uh, forensic reasons. Uh, if you committed a crime and five years later you could claim to be a different person, then you couldn't be held responsible. Uh, up until Locke's time, continuity was provided by the soul. Increasingly, people uh, began to either doubt its existence uh, or certainly uh, worry that it was something that uh, was empirically not observable. So Locke thought about the person and others uh, went running with the concept uh, and it became the dominant way in the West of thinking about individuals. Uh, at roughly the same time, there were two developments um, uh, in Western culture. Uh, the first is the, uh, if not the emergence, the deepening of something called interiority. And psychologists uh, describe this as the ability to step back from yourself and your life and reflect on it. Uh, to think about the different roles that you perform and really um, who you are. In traditional society, the person was the sum of the roles they performed. That was it. Uh, there was little attention paid to the inner life. Once interiority developed, uh, it became necessary to go beyond roles to define the person. And this is due to the second development. And that is the multiplication of roles that people perform. 
you could be, a, you know, a, a, a father or a partner uh, for part of the day, a, a teacher or a truck driver in another, a coach, uh, things that had you behaving in very different ways and presenting yourself quite differently to the people with whom you were dealing. So some degree of conflict arose when you reflected upon this. You would be asking yourself, well, is there a real me here? Um, who am I? Uh, there must be something more than the notion of roles. This produced um, a serious um, interest in the inner self and distinguishing it from the social self. So the concept of the person evolved to take on this, uh, this other component. And Kant and Hegel are really the first people to theorize how it produced a degree of anxiety and alienation. Because the more roles you performed, as I noticed, as I said, uh, the more confused you became about uh, who you are. So we developed this notion that uh, there must be some self lurking there that we could discover and develop. And this idea was uh, propagated uh, by romantics, beginning with uh, Rousseau, who's the great authority on this and urges us to reject society and commune with nature and look inside ourselves to discover who we are and then to develop it. This has become largely conventional wisdom in the West. So when people speak about identity, A, they believe there is one, and B, they believe that we have some ability to engage in self-fashioning, and C, they believe that we need to do this to become happy and fulfilled selves. So that's how identity emerges and becomes a key modern project for the individual in the Western world. The existence of an identity and the quest for individual uniqueness and the belief in self-fashioning are all highly questionable. And again, I don't want to go into the uh, varieties of arguments um, against it, uh, but I will just give uh, a brief overview. I, for example, uh, drawing on uh, Buddhist understandings of the self and also on work in psychology on memory and work in sociology on self-fashioning, most notably that of uh, George Herbert Mead, uh, argue that there is no self, that the, the self, meaning identity, a coherent single identity is, is a delusion. And rather, what we are, are a sum of identification. So here, the term identification, and this is a direct answer to your question now, is offered in contrast to that of identity. So if we think about ourselves, we have multiple self-identifications. They arise from our affiliations. Uh, think about uh, defining yourself as a, a, a son or daughter or a um, uh, a partner of somebody or a parent of somebody else or friends of others or uh, followers of a particular football team, uh, being a member of a particular uh, 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 approach to the study of your subject, uh, feeling a, a, a common identity with others who approach the subject the same way. These are all affiliations. Uh, that give us a sense of who we are. Secondly, and I have noted these already, the roles um, that we play. And we play multiple roles, and these roles uh, change in the course of our lives. 
the third source of self-identifications is our relation with our bodies. I know in days that we're not feeling sick in almost all languages, we say we're not feeling ourselves. A recognition that our body is very central to us. And of course, um, this includes a whole range of aspects about our body, not only how we feel about our gender. And then the final source of uh, self-identifications are our biographies. By biography, I mean individual biography, but collective biographies. Uh, we tend to associate with religions, ethnicities, countries, all kinds of groups, and their histories, to the extent that we associate with them, affiliate with them, become our histories. So all of these things generate self-identifications, and we'll come later to social identifications imposed by others on us from outside. Let's just stay with the, with the self ones. And what I and other people uh, who are critical of identity argue is that these self-identifications uh, evolve over the course of time in their contents. They rise and fall in importance. Um, their relative importance is very much a function of timing and context. And it can be uh, 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 even produced uh, deliberately uh, by others uh, if they send uh, the right signals. Uh, if somebody comes wearing a, a, a scarf from a particular football team and you see it, uh, you're likely to think about your own affiliations. And for the moment, that will rise uh, uh, to the fore. So these identifications are multiple. And the important thing that follows is that they're not all consistent in their implications for our beliefs, values, and behavior. Uh, very often, uh, they produce uh, a, a different imperatives for behavior. They produce different kinds of ethical understandings, different kinds of loyalties. So they're often in conflict. And how we behave or how we think about ourselves or how we think who we are will be a function of which ones tend to be dominant at any given moment. And it's also true that if we uh, sit back and reflect on this, it, of course, can be troubling, which is one of the reasons why people look for a deeper level of a self that somehow integrates all of these things. But there's no evidence whatsoever that such a self exists or can be created. Now, the, the other issue that comes into play here is that the romantics uh, who have flogged and sold us quite successfully on the notion of identity and self-fashioning and becoming ourselves largely ignore the extent to which our identities are social. From the get-go, we're told who we are. We're encouraged to have certain affiliations and roles and all kinds of identifications and various positive and negative qualities associated with them are imposed on us from the outside. And I'm thinking in the first instance of all these nasty ethnic, racial, gender stereotypes that can be very restrictive, but also all the messages about identity that children get from the time they're very young, from television, social media, their classmates, their teachers, uh, telling them how to be themselves and being quite judgmental about people who physically or socially or intellectually don't fit into the assigned uh, roles. And even when people feel comfortable with their social roles, they make the mistake of thinking that they've chosen them uh, rather than they've been encouraged 
uh, or even taught and psychologically compelled uh, to accept those understandings. So we have to think of ourselves as fragmented and social and caught in a, in a matrix uh, over which we have little control. Um, however, the more we understand that that's the situation, that in some ways is the first step toward gaining control. Now, let me come to the second part of your question now, which is the state. So, as I have said, uh, people have both internal and external identities. They have their own self-identifications, and they have those that are imposed on them. States have no psyches. <laughs> They're not people, and it's a huge mistake to generalize from people to states. States are completely different. They're a, a set of institutions. Huh? What happens is that people attempt to impose identities on states. And they do so to advance their psychological and political and economic goals. Hmm? If you can uh, define a state in a particular way, uh, then you may get people to support what you want. Look at this horrible Brexit um, in Britain. Uh, uh, Right-wing Tories, nostalgic imperialists, and really uh, uh, people with an economic agenda hmm, to reduce taxes and to escape from all of the controls of the European Union and European court so that they could exploit cheap labor, uh, dump sewerage uh, into the water, make more money. Uh, those were the people who were behind Brexit, but they managed to sell it and get uh, support in a referendum by associating it with British identity. Huh? So there's a, a, an example of how you impose an identity on a state and get political support for it. And clearly, uh, those people who opposed it defined themselves not only as British, but also as European, had a very different understanding of the character and identity, if you'll have it, of the British state. Uh, Scottish nationalists have a very different understanding too than, let's say, either the Tory or the Labour Party. And what happens here is that States are like refrigerators that people sometimes put magnets on that reflect all, all kinds of things. And the refrigerator has no say in the matter. <laughs> it doesn't say, I don't want that on my door. It just is passive. Well, so are states. And lots of magnets are up there. And the magnets are symbolizing quite competing understandings. So much of domestic politics is about uh, fostering and propagating identities of your state. It's a huge mistake to think that states have identities. And of course, there's a branch of, uh, of international relations that does this called ontological security. Huh? And people make the argument that leaders are punished if they don't uh, uh, pursue policies that reflect the identities of their states. Well, there are no identities, and even if there were, they could be so broadly interpreted and the meaning of your policies so broadly interpreted that none of this would, would really matter. Uh, but leaders pretend that such things happen. Every time uh, I, in the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan, when American soldiers would do something uh, terrible, well, like torturing prisoners, whoever was president at the time would say, this is not us. This, this doesn't reflect who we are, uh, as if we're a people with a very clear sense of values and identity. This is all political fiction. And we as analysts should not succumb to it. Why people want to know that identity? Does it come from the philosophical base or... Is it sort of like natural curiosity? It's hard to know. Scholars, particularly in the social sciences, uh, like 
parsimonious models. Uh, they like concepts that they can use to explain a lot of things. So realists, let's make an analogy. Realists attribute everything to power and the balance of power. And that's as fatuous um, as identity. Con for constructivists, identity has plays the role that power does for realists. And I could wax and wane eloquently about how polarity and balance of power are relatively meaningless, uh, but we're talking about constructivism and identity, so that's what I'm criticizing today. And I think to make yourself a paradigm, uh, you need to define things in ways that uh, make you <laughs> give your paradigm an identity. <laughs> and so once you have to do that for psychological and political reasons, then you're playing fast and loose with the facts. When people and scholars and also students research identity, and then they have your point of view of identification, is it a different research in terms of like how to approach identity and how to approach identification? So they're very different. So scholars who work, let's talk about international relations now. now scholars who focus on identity believe that there is such a thing, believe states have identities, and therefore are interested, uh, their research agenda is discovering what those identities are, how they evolve, and what their consequences are for policies. Right? Uh, if you started from my perspective, you would recognize that all appeals to identity are um, rhetorical. Right? That people are claiming that this is who we are as a country in order to mobilize support for a policy they want for completely different reasons. So I think the people who deal with identity are naive politically and psychologically. When you were speaking about identity, you mentioned that it comes from the Western philosophy. And my question is, how is identity and identification, how are those concepts understood elsewhere? For instance, India. China, maybe Russia. So I, I, I have to respond with a caveat at mm -hmm. first, and that is that my linguistic and historical expertise is entirely Western. Um, I, I can only speak secondhand about other regions of the world. And I, here I have uh, two observations to make that uh, these regions have conceived of people differently. Um, but they've also been infected by Western concept conceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as with many other things, Western ideas and values have penetrated other parts of the world and have not necessarily replaced um, indigenous conceptions and approaches, but coexist um, with them. If we look at India, um, it first thing we see is that we can't speak of an Indian tradition and an Indian identity because there are different Indian traditions, different conceptions of identity that vary with religion, with uh, philosophy, and with region. Huh? And we should be clear, too, that that same kind of diversity um, has existed in the West uh, traditionally. Uh, I find the Indian uh, Buddhist concept of identity the, the most interesting one. And uh, from it, uh, Westerners have borrowed the notion of the phenomenal self. And this is that we, we only exist in the moment. You know, right now, who I am is a person speaking to you, Martin. <laughs> and um, 
uh, if you ask me who I am, it's going to be very much influenced by the context uh, of this uh, of this discussion. And a minute from now, I'm going to be a different person than I was a minute ago. And several years from now, I will, of course, be a very different uh, person. If you think about your life, uh, it's it's hard to find that much continuity uh, in it. And that continuity tends to come from narratives that we invent to create that continuity. And I think that people across cultures feel a, a universal need to do this, to feel comfortable with themselves. So there, there are aspects of things that are cultural, some that transcend culture, and this last one uh, does, I think. Because if one looks at uh, Chinese or Indian or Middle East texts, uh, there's a similar attempt, for the most part, to create the continuity. The Buddhists are very clearly the outlier um, here. Yeah, I mean, I have also similar experience because once I spoke with a scholar who was focusing on China and research about China, and he told me, in China, the most important is a group of people. Well, uh, uh, your Chinese respondent may have been exaggerating to to, to some degree, I, I'm sure. But there have been a, a very interesting set of uh, psychological studies, uh, some of them conducted by Chinese psychologists, uh, on these issues. And none of them find um, a completely different understanding than in the West. But they do find differences between China um, and the West. Uh, one of the things that communists uh, did was to effectively stamp out Buddhism and Confucianism uh, and to impose uh, their own set of values. So China became less diverse than it traditionally was. But now, with communism increasingly being taken tongue-in-cheek by Chinese, especially educated ones, uh, there's very little tradition out there to shape how they think and feel. So they face uh, quite a different problem than their Western counterparts. Uh, but I, again, come back to, to your own life uh, to think this through. My case may be extreme. So in my um, 82 years <laughs> of life, um, I've changed parents, countries, and languages. Uh, and professions, um, and even wives. I mean, I have, I've been married 50 years to the, to, to the current one. But by definition, I was a different person in these different social, political, and familial circumstances. Uh, and it's true to a degree um, of all of us. But we construct narratives, and we're encouraged to, uh, to make ourselves singular and continuous. Uh, and, and here, too, uh, your students might, might find this interesting. There's very good work on memory uh, that begins in the U.S. with F.C. Bartlett, in uh, France with Marcel Mauss, and in uh, Russia with uh, Lev Vygotsky, all working early in the 20th century, uh, showing how uh, false uh, memory is. And seeing memory, uh, the same with identifications, as something that is as much, if not more, social in nature than personal. Uh, that we, in effect, remake our memories to suit our social needs of the moment. There's, a, to me, the experiment that uh, uh, most dramatically illustrates this is done by the late um, Ulrich uh, Nysa, who taught in, in Florida. And I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, he was teaching uh, psychology 101 quite close to uh, Cape Canaveral when the Challenger disaster occurred. 
Well, so very much a, a local event, so to speak, even though the disaster took place over Texas, the rocket had been launched uh, from Florida. He asked his Psych 101 students uh, the next day or two days later to write down what they remembered of the event, what they thought of it at the time, what they had said to other people or what other people had said to them about it. He even asked them what they were wearing and what they had done that day uh, and had them take a whole 50 minutes of the class to do this, sign their name and hand it in. Two years later, most of them were still students at the university. He managed to get a high percentage of them to do the exercise a second time. Five years after the event, they were all graduates, but he got about half to do the exercise a third time. He then compared uh, what they wrote the day after it happened, two years later, five years later. He found a convergence in what people believed, in what they thought they said they had said, what others had said to them, even what clothing um, they wore. The only explanation was that they had subsequently received social cues, and the event had been interpreted by others over time. They, in turn, assimilated the interpretation of the event that was being put out by uh, the media. He went and he interviewed a number of these people, showed them first what they had just written, i.e. five years after the event, and said, are you sure that this is what you remember and what you said? Oh, yes, everybody said this is, this is accurate. He then showed them what they wrote at the time of the disaster and how very different it was. They struggled to make sense of it. Some even denied that they had written it, even though their name was across the top of the page. Um, that's, that's a very interesting example, I have to say. Yeah. And it's been replicated by all kinds of, uh, of, of other research. And uh, why NYSA chose to do this, uh, uh, psychologists talk about flashbulb memories. And I'll have to explain this because we're dealing with a generation of students <laughs> who's never seen a flashbulb. Uh, uh, flashbulbs were uh, little uh, lamps uh, which fit uh, onto a camera with a reflector behind them. When you went to take a picture indoors, when you pressed the shutter on the camera, an electric signal would trigger the flashbulb and it would whoop, and produce this blinding light, which for an instant would light up the room and enable you to take a picture in good, in good focus with a, a camera indoors. The notion is uh, that if you've ever been exposed to a flashbulb, whatever image you were looking at at the time when that light came is etched on, on your eyeballs. And for another so many seconds, all you see is that same image. So it's very vivid, very sharp and lasting. So psychologists uh, used it to refer to dramatic events that people experience collectively, not individually. So my first flashbulb memory was the death of Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, then the second, uh, VE Day, when the Allies won the war. Kennedy assassination is often taken. My youngest son, the fall of the Berlin Wall, is his first flashbulb memory. And people all claim to have more vivid and honest and enduring memories of these events than of other things. Huh? And they're also wonderful for psychologists because all kinds of people experience them, so you can make comparisons. And it's quite striking how malleable uh, they are. In fact, more so than memories not shared with other people. The Supreme Court in the United States, I mean, it has institutional memory. It's called precedent. Uh, although uh, people appointed by Donald Trump uh, seem unlike judges and constitutional lawyers traditionally to uh, reject uh, the legitimacy of, of precedent and just do their own thing. 
But yes, that's a form of, of, of state memory. And states also have memory. Uh, so I receive uh, my Social Security, my American pension. The state has a memory of my entire working career, uh, which is essential to it to know when I should be paid a pension and how much on the basis of what I've contributed. So yeah, in that sense, states have memories. And they can be fiddled with. Think about uh, uh, how it first began in the Stalinist era, where people who lost favor and were purged were airbrushed out of photographs. So the state was erasing the memory of their existence. It's now become uh, a common uh, uh, process. And of course, we're still. Uh, we now have uh, false images and statements propagated everywhere um, on the internet uh, to create different historical memories. And yet, that's another sign, I would argue, of my argument that historical memory is politically contested at all times by by all political actors. And how do you approach uh, other actors of international relations? Mostly, I mean, on international corporations. So, I, I, again, I'm not an expert um, on this, but yes, uh, uh, corporations do this. I've been told by people who've gone through what's called the coming aboard process, that they've been taught about the company's values and identities. And I even have a younger brother Uh, who at one point was senior vice president of Microsoft, uh, who was very involved in shaping the identity of a company and then of writing about it. But again, it's like states. In this case, it's economic actors who were trying to create an identity uh, for an organization to either increase sales, uh, have a better... Uh, Uh, standing with the public to reduce lawsuits uh, or to advance the interest of one faction in the corporation over another. So in that sense, it's a parallel process, I'm guessing. Universities, too, do this. I mean, yeah. universities have <laughs> claim to have strong identities. I mean, at the moment, for example, Harvard is struggling with <laughs> with with who it is. With different people, it's, it's a good example because different people are saying this is what Harvard is, and the Harvards that they're describing are not mutually compatible, are they? And I also notice that some institutions they use different synonyms. For instance, this is our DNA instead of identity. Oh, that's you know? interesting. I hadn't heard that, but it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It's very interesting how people can use words to express, you know, oh, and and very effectively. And and it's only a, you know with the DNA only a small percentage that's uh, that, that differs, and yet there are all these nationalists who mm. think bloodlines um, are important, whereas all the research by um, uh, uh, by biologists who study human inheritance time and time again show how we're all a mixture, completely interbred. And that any ways in which we look different are, are at best skin deep. Uh, but people don't want to buy this. On the other hand, think think of the political implications. If everybody recognized that we're all descendants from Lucy, huh? and of course Lucy never existed, but a small group of people in Africa did, and we're all descendants of them. Now, if you could frame yourself that way, Rather than thinking, oh, you know, um, Russian or um, Chinese, uh, it would have profound implications for political and cultural uh, events and behavior. Absolutely. Now, let's speak a little bit about political order. And okay. what is what is the connection between political order, its nature? You know, people speak about regimes as well, authoritarian regimes, democratic regimes, and etc. Et what, what, is, what is the 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 connection between identification, identity, and political order? Human beings are social animals. Aristotle was right uh, to 
open his politics with the description of us that way. We live in societies. Those societies over time have become larger and larger and larger. When we lived in small groups, families, clans, tribes, we knew everybody face to face. And the group was small enough that it could live primarily uh, on the basis of the principles of equality and fairness. Equality has a traditional meaning that we all share whatever it is that matters. And fairness means those who contribute the most get the most. Uh, what we note when we study those remaining, uh, I won't call them primitive, it's a wrong term, but isolated uh, groups of people who are uh, less economically or technologically developed, uh, almost all of them emphasize equality over fairness, although there's an element of fairness um, as well. And their order uh, is based on adhering to those principles in their relations with one another. And you can see this with animals as well. I mean, there's the famous uh, Franz de Waal's uh, grape and cucumber experiment, which you probably know. Oh, this, so is what I, this is what I don't know. This you can see, and uh, your students might be interested too. You can see it on YouTube. And it's Franz de Waals, W-A-A-L-S. But all you need to do is uh, is is uh, search for uh, monkey and grape or monkey and fruit. And uh, so monkeys, uh, uh, bonobos, chimpanzees, they share. And people who take food and hide it for themselves if discovered, become ostracized. You don't, you don't do this. You get expelled from the group. At the same time, uh, people expect to be rewarded in similar ways. So in the experiment, they give a piece of, maybe it's not a cucumber, something, uh, some vegetable, to a monkey every time it takes a, a little rock or a marble and puts it in a box. And the monkey's very happy doing this and getting rewarded. Then they go to the next cage to a second monkey who's visible to the first monkey. They perform the same experiment, but the monkey is rewarded with a richer piece of fruit, a, a grape. And the first monkey watches this with increasing annoyance. They then go back to the first monkey, ask him to put the stone in the box. He or she does and they reward him with the cucumber. The monkey's furious and throws the cucumber at the experimenter, the ethologist who's doing the work. Uh, so there's a strong sense of justice. Societies of all kinds are held together by justice. This becomes problematic when societies grow in size. Adam Smith was the first person, uh, um, sorry, I, I meant David Hume, was the first person to theorize about this. Because when a society becomes large enough, people can cheat. <laughs> they can become free riders. They can do all kinds of things without it being noticed. So you have to enforce order by different means. And you need institutions uh, to do it. Uh, courts, judges, police, what, whatever it is. Uh, and of course, international order is more complex. Uh, still. So the problem of order is a problem that derives from human nature and, and human needs. Uh, and we have to think about what it is that holds orders together, uh, why they congeal, uh, how they deal with change, and why they collapse. Uh, and my book on political order addresses um, these questions from a comparative, historical, philosophical, and psychological perspective. Uh, and uh, it's particularly relevant today because democratic orders everywhere are under serious threat. Uh, the 
if there is such a thing as an international order, uh, it's under threat. And here, too, we can now come to uh, the similarity with identity. Uh, I noted earlier, uh, repeatedly, that people tried to impose understandings of identity on states that were consistent with their goals. People do the same in international relations, in describing the order. So Americans uh, are always talking about the liberal rule-based international order, huh? which, of course, is a fiction, but it's a framing that gives Americans special status and special privileges. So they have very strong incentives to define it this way. Russians, Chinese, and Indians have very different understandings of, of international law. One of the problems uh, has been uh, that there's no um, effort of compromise or of superseding parochial understandings to have even some common minimum understanding of an order from which everybody could benefit in a more equal uh, more equal way. Uh, this process is, of course, uh, also true uh, domestically. Um, what we found in the last 10 years, for a variety of reasons, is that understandings of what domestic order is, uh, the, whatever consensus there was, has broken down. Uh, in the United States, in Germany, in France, in Britain, uh, I, 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 this is a common phenomenon, uh, and much of it has common causes, which we won't go into for the moment, but it leads to uh, a preference for different principles of justice and for different rules of governance. But evangelical supporters, a significant number of them in the United States who support Trump, see him as an agent of God that will fundamentally get rid of the Constitution, make the United States into a, uh, a religious Christian country, uh, a, a Christian version of the Iran of the Ayatollahs. Uh, whereas liberal Democrats have a completely different understanding of what America is and who Americans are. Uh, I mean, this is just an extreme example of a common phenomenon. So order and identity all become connected um, as part of the same political struggle. If we have many streams of constructivism, what would be your main criticism of constructivism and identity research? All right. So let me tell you what I like about it and what I don't like about it. What I like about it in contrast to um, realism, liberalism, Marxism, all of these are structural theories. They believe that such a thing as structures out there that those structures generate imperatives and that people who succeed uh, conform to those imperatives or at least are significantly influenced uh, by them. Mm. Uh, constructivism starts from a premise that we need to construct the world as people themselves understand it. Uh, that actors don't necessarily see the world alike and certainly don't necessarily see it the way some analyst does. Indeed, not all analysts understand it that way. Take the balance of power, mm -hmm. or excuse me, polarity. Uh, Kenneth Waltz, who died after the Cold War had ended, insisted that the world was still bipolar, because only the Soviet Union and the US at the time had the capability to destroy it. Many realists, the majority perhaps, said the world is now multipolar. And my Dartmouth colleagues, Bill Walforth, Steve Brooks, Mike Mastanduno, were among a smaller number of realists who said, no, the world is unipolar. Mm -hmm. There's one pole. So here, 
for realists, structure is all important, but they can't even agree among themselves um, what it is. And they can't because, uh, and uh, this may also be of use uh, to students, think of the difference between the balance of power and temperature. Hmm? Balance of power is what? Well, it's a measure of military might, economic might, population, size of territory. Uh, uh, there's no idea how these different things should be weighted, and there's no agreement about how any of them should be measured. So it's ideas all the way down. There's no, no reality. There's nothing, in fact, there, which is why you can't have a consensus about what it is. Temperature refers to something real, the energy level of molecules. Hmm. Centigrade, Celsius, Fahrenheit uh, are all uh, readily translatable one to the other because they're measuring the same thing. And one of my uh, physicists, uh, for actually my son, one of my sons says, well, if they were physicists, they presumably are on other planets, uh, you can't do physics, physics without knowing the energy level of molecules. They'd have their own scales and they'd be readily translatable in two hours. So we're not talking about anything real. And if that's so, then we come to constructivism, which is, first question is, do, do people or political leaders even think about polarity? And if they do, what do they think about it? Because that's all um, mm -hmm. that matters. So we're creating a world from the bottom up rather than from the top down. And that has powerful implications for the kind of theories we make and how we go about doing them. And in this sense, I'm fully constructivist. Mm -hmm. Where I'm unhappy with constructivism uh, is, as I noted earlier, that many constructivists seem to focus on identity and take it as something that's real and treat it as the constructivist version of, of power uh, for realists. And uh, this seems to me uh, a huge error. We ought to be rejecting this. Many people are now, you know, taking a look at the Gaza, at Israel, and we have United Nations, and many people are wondering, is it still relevant? Does, well, you know, how, how does it work in the constructivist, like, perspective and your point of view? Well, I, I, I don't know that you have to be a constructivist or a realist. Uh, in this sense, uh, representatives of both might give the same answer. Uh, the UN is an international institution that by its very nature must function on the basis of consensus. When there is no consensus, it can't act. Uh, which is probably a good thing because then it it would have broken up long ago if it compelled others to do things they didn't want. It brings people together, gives them an opportunity to talk and formally ignore all the speeches <laughs> that they make. It's the informal meetings over tea and whiskey um, that matter. Uh, it plays uh, an important uh, role in international relations. I think the mistake is that there are many people who have a thoroughly uh, false and misleading understanding of what it should be doing. They expect more of it than it can possibly do. Ned, many thanks for your insightful thoughts about constructivism, identity, your remarks. It was a pleasure to speak with you, and thank you for being on Higher Thinker. Well, thank you, Martin, and thank you for asking such interesting and intelligent questions. See you next time.